And what a terrific uh, video to get us uh, started uh, today. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the first session of the World Economic Forum uh, virtual Davos on this uh, Tuesday. Uh, this session is dedicated to one of the cornerstones of the forum, the implementation of stakeholder capitalism, uh, in essence, breaking it down, looking far beyond the prism of shareholder return and profit, and instead taking a holistic approach to uh, corporate governance and how that interfaces with the greater good for society. I'm John Defterius, the Emerging Markets Editor of CNN, uh, in a discussion here where we bridge the developed and developing world when it comes to governance. The International Business Council of the World Economic Forum has proposed a set of universal metrics covering environmental, social, and governance, better known as uh, ESG, which has gathered a great deal of momentum within the Davos community, and equally importantly, in global financial capitals, especially in the West. And that's where uh, the discussion around the developing or emerging markets comes into the fore. Our goal here in 45 minutes is to gauge progress over the past year since the World Economic Forum <laughs> uh, physically in Davos in 2020. And you will see with the mix of panelists from Europe, uh, the UAE and India, how this is being adopted concurrently, as I suggested, uh, to the developing world. Let me introduce our panelists that you see in the boxes uh, here today. Uh, His Excellency Mohammed Abdullah al Gargawi is the Minister of Cabinet Affairs uh, here in the UAE. He's joining us from uh, Dubai. Uh, we have Ilham Kadri, the Chief Executive Officer and Chair, a uh, woman of Solve, the chemical group out of Belgium, and Anand Mahindra, the Chairman of the Mahindra Group, joining us uh, from India. Uh, we were supposed to have the uh, Minister of Finance for South Africa, Tito Mobweni, uh, joining us, but he's in Eastern South Africa and they've been hit with a cyclone, which has actually unfortunately disconnected him from electricity during the session here today. And we, of course, uh, hope that he is well as, at the same time during this uh, very powerful cy cyclone in South Africa. Uh, let me welcome in Professor Klaus Schwab, the executive chairman, of course, of the World Economic Forum. Uh, he's going to join us to set the framework at the beginning, but uh, very happy he's going to stay for the entire 45 minutes, as he noted during our uh, green room discussion beforehand. It's such an important issue that it deserves uh, the cont contributions across the board from the World Economic Forum. Uh, I think, uh, Klaus, a good place for us to start is now 50 years into the concept of uh, stakeholder governance. Uh, it's an ideological framework, but is it a framework now that's going into action? Is that what we see here through the International <laughs> Business Council? It's, it's the real deal? Yes, uh, I think uh, 2021 will be a historical year in terms of changing the philosophy of business, moving from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism, also accelerated, of course, by the consequences of uh, COVID-19. Now, why do we need uh, stakeholder capitalism? See, the theme of this meeting is restoring trust. If we want to restore trust, the precondition is to show that when we work together, we work not only for our own interest, but we work for society's interest and for the interest of everybody who works together with us. Now, until now, um, stakeholder capitalism was some kind of a vague concept. But we will announce today, as you John said, uh, we will walk the talk. And um, we have, with the International Business Council, elaborated a concept of metrics which allow a, an approach uh, where business can report and be, say, on, on the stakeholder responsibility and say can be measured. Until now, usually you had declarations, but now business will be held accountable uh, how much it really achieves the ESG um, objectives. And we will announce today that 61 companies um, will endorse the stakeholder capitalism metrics. Uh, they represent over 4.3 trillion in market capital and some 7 million employees. And we know this concept will not be the final one, because even uh, if you look at financial metrics, um, it took years until we had a general, uh, generally accepted framework. But it's a beginning, and I think it's a milestone. 
Yes, you, have, you mentioned the, the membership here uh, of 61 uh, companies signing on board. Uh, just for the purposes of our, our viewers online today, that's going to be released at uh, 1300 CET. Uh, yeah. One additional question, uh, Professor, is the momentum there now, going to 61 and doubling up every year, uh, this is the year of COP26. Uh, what do you think the forum can do in terms of uh, tripling that number by the end of 2020? Is, it, is that uh, realistic in your view? Of course, uh, the um, stakeholder responsibility in principle comprises three different responsibilities, to be responsible for prosperity, to be responsible for people, and to be responsible for the planet. And uh, being responsible for the planet means to engage actively uh, in uh, driving forward decarbonization in our world. And we have a number of task forces, and if you look at the program of this uh, special annual meeting here, this virtual annual meeting, you will see that uh, quite a number of sessions are, determined, are planned to make real progress in terms of uh, achieving uh, the objectives 2030, but particularly in preparing also the COP26. Terrific. Let me bring in Mohammed Al Gargawi, His Excellency, the uh, Minister of Cabinet Affairs in the UAE. Uh, what have governments learned from this process? Uh, would you suggest, Minister, uh, with the pandemic, uh, and again this year being such a crucial one for COP26? What is the role of governments as you see it today, with the external challenges that we've been uh, dealing with all around the world? As a matter of fact. Uh, let me start, uh, John, by, by stating uh, this year the most affected uh, organization in the world are government. Uh, we have government who fail miserably in handling the pandemic, and maybe few government did a good, a good job. I think if we look at the numbers, I mean, of last year, during the same time, we had only 2,000 cases, 52 deaths. Today, just 12 months down the road, it is 100 million, 2 million deaths worldwide. With the pandemic and the speed, it is, I mean, the speed of the spreading, uh, the virus was 4 million Fold. And that's created a tsunami for government globally. I mean, the most important thing today is how do we balance between our health, economy, society? How do we vaccinate the world population? Only 63 million people got vaccinated in 56 countries so far. In the Emirates, we, we are number two. Israel is number one with close to 39% of the population. In the Emirates, we are around 25% of the population and there is a daily increase here. But the most important thing is we have to look as government, global government, at the total population in the world. We understand by the end of the year, maybe half of the population will be vaccinated, but unfortunately, the other half wouldn't have the mean. So for us, it is not a single government, and this is very important. We cannot work alone as a silo government. This is a global spread, and this is the only time, maybe in recent history of mankind, where everybody have to come together. I believe that government have to adopt to a new role right now. And the way we looked at government, it is we, we live in a hybrid world. Government have to be fast. They have to be agile. They have to be proactive. And they have to work very closely with the private sector, very closely, much more than before. You wouldn't have the old style of government anymore because the old style will fail. And we are seeing it failing in so many different countries. So what we'll have, we'll have a government that need to adopt to the changes that's taken place. 
an example, I think government and the private sector can work very closely. Usually, you know, things take ages. The virus itself, the vaccine itself, government work very closely with the private sector in developing this, this vaccine. They change very fast, a lot of law, and within a couple of months, a new thing is happening. There is a hope for the rest of the world. I think government have to reinvent their model. Uh, the model been there for almost 200 years, didn't change. Government have to be embedded with technology. There is a new norm. I mean, our meeting is a new norm. Usually private sector work from home. That was normal. Government have to adopt with a lot of changes. But the most important thing is, I think, for government is they have to be fast, they have to be agile, and they have to change and reinvent themselves in the next decade. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. I'm going to follow up also on this role for the UAE uh, as a crossroads between East and West and with the vaccine supplies. Uh, the vaccine diplomacy, which I think could be very interesting to reach out uh, into the region. Uh, I, I think it's extraordinary. You said uh, fast, agile, and, and uh, to reinvent yourselves. I had been uh, coaching some of the journalist students here at the uh, CNN Academy, and I always say fast, agile, and deep uh, as governments as well, to have that depth uh, to respond to such a, a challenge. We have Ilham Kadri in, in the screen here. Uh, and Ilham, before I introduce you, there are, I want to let our audience know that there's 21 core metrics uh, to this process here of uh, stakeholder uh, capitalism, uh, 34 broader ones. Let's bring this down to earth so people understand the work that you're you're doing and somebody like an, Anand Mahindra from the corporate side as well. How will it impact society? It, they, is it far reaching, too far away from the average investor or the average consumer to understand this or really have a profound impact? Yeah, good morning, uh, John, and thank you for having me. Well, listen, the ESG concerns have been steadily increasing since the 90s with the emergence of a number of initiatives related to the disclosure, GRI, uh, the UN Global Compact, the RSC, uh, the SDGs, the SASB, et cetera, you name them. The resulting multiple frameworks and disclosure standards uh, has been good, but created a bit of con confusion. So that said, it is a fact that there is a wealth of non-financial metrics that are already uh, been published um, and, and the fact that such information has been rarely used by investors in the way, in a coherent, a coherent way. So in our view, the, the adoption of a common standard, just the stakeholder capitalism metrics, brings a great benefit to key stakeholders because it promotes a deeper understanding and benchmarking thanks to the harmonization of key metrics across industries, right? It also brings a lot of uh, transparency. It's about having a common language uh, that focuses on what is material and prerequisites uh, for progress. So you talk there are different uh, stakeholders here, authorities. Um, His Excellency talks about that. We've seen a lot of movements on climate, the EU Council decision to strengthen the greenhouse gas emission for 2030 to minus 55% uh, carbon neutrality by 2050 in Europe, uh, 2060 in China. The, the Biden administration mm -hmm. uh, coming back to, to the Paris Accord. So what's in there for the investors? Uh, first of all, the agency and the real opportunity is really launching an international standard. Again, common language, setting the process that delivers a global baseline system uh, for corporate reporting in order to report to investors on how sustainability performance of company affects the creation of an enterprise value and encourage capital market regulators to cooperate with the IFRS Foundation, for example, towards a global solution. For, for businesses, it gives more insight and support of the private sector to cooperate with security regulators moving forward. It's also more transparent to, to our customers and their customers about our real non-financial performance. And finally, on society, John, uh, Professor Schwab said it, uh, I believe it's about restoring trust, the importance of established global baseline system of the, uh, in, in this report and as a first concrete step of which any individual, right, any citizen of the world can, can relate to 
um, such as the European Union is doing and can build more specific requirements uh, on their own public policy goals. So in my mind, time is of essence. And it's possible that some participants here and there be differing views on some metrics. We believe at Solvit that it's preferable to get started and refine over time, supplement the metrics with others that we consider pertinent rather than allow ourselves to be slowed down by search for the most complete, comprehensive or perfect set of metrics. Very interesting the way you say that. Let's bring in Anand Mahindra. I know through the IBC of the World Economic Forum, you've been very proactive on this frontier. I would like to ask you the same question. What, what is the difference within Mahindra in terms of the relationship with investors but and your partners, but also society? Because I, I know you're very passionate about uh, the impact that Mahindra should have on society here and then moving the dialogue. And then let me uh, couple that with, if I can, Anand, the progress you've seen at the IBC since uh, WEF 2020 when we, when we were together. Yeah, morning, John, and uh, again, it's a privilege to be here. Your question about um, what we see as the benefit of all of this to various segments of society. Well, I'm an investor as well as a businessman and a member of society, all rolled into one, as of course are the other members of the panel, at least Ilhan for sure. So the best way to answer that question is to, to tell you why I think that the adoption of ESG metrics is going to be beneficial to each of these avatars, if you will. Now, as an investor, I'm well aware that the secret of successful investing is to ride the tide, if you will. And that tide today, thanks to the efforts of bodies like the IBC, is clearly running in favor of investments and enterprises that see themselves as part of a larger social picture. And uh, the, His Excellency referred to the pandemic. Now that's particularly thrown up all the fault lines in our society and shown that the welfare of business and society is actually linked to the welfare of its weakest members. Um, mm -hmm. Now, you know, an investment proposal, investors will look at proposals that have wider perspectives and that would influence my investment decisions as an investor. As a businessman, I look at two factors. How do I grow my business sustainably? And at the same time, how do I meet the needs and aspirations of my consumers? India has 1.3 billion people. And the middle and lower segments of that pyramid are a potential powerhouse of consumption. And so therefore it's really in my self-interest as a businessman to build businesses through the and economic prospects of as many peace people as possible. And there's one more thing, John, that the millennials and the Gen Z, who are going to be the consumers of tomorrow, there's very strong evidence that they're going to put their money and their custom behind these expectations. So being a good quote unquote business is going to be good for business. And that's a similar role being played by communities who are getting very vocal about which businesses they would welcome and not. And finally, we're all members of society. So, you know, it's a shame. I have children and grandchildren, and by the way, I am a grandfather now. It's glaringly obvious that it's our responsibility to leave a living and working planet and not some kind of dystopian nightmare to them all. So measurement really converts mm -hmm. intent into action. The ESG metrics are important markers they indicate our progress towards leaving our planet a better place than we found it, rather than leaving those are just nice words. Uh, I can talk more about what the uh, IBC has done, but I'll, I'll stop for a moment, John. I'm happy to come back to that at a later point. Okay, very good. I, I want to open this up uh, in terms of a dialogue amongst our panelists. And just a reminder, if you want to follow up on any of the inputs from your fellow panelists, just to uh, flag me with the pen uh, or give me a signal here, because I'm looking at you on my screens. It's a little bit of a challenge, but we'll make it work. I wanted to take a question from the audience, and this is one for uh, Minister Gurgawi, if I may here. Um, the question is, what's the role of governments interfacing with companies to hit these metrics? And how do you have government private sector uh, contributions uh, that can make a difference and accelerate this transition? Would you say, uh, Minister Gargali? Uh, let me start with, with a number, uh, John. I mean, if we, if from March last year to now, if you look at the United States and you look at top company or, or individual, 
their gain during the pandemic was close to $800 billion. A few people during a very tough time, they, they made a certain amount of wealth, actually. And, and I'm, I'm just putting this number is to look at only 600 billionaire made 930 billion during a short span of time, and it's a tough economic time. Meanwhile, we are looking at how much half of the population actually of the world cannot be vaccinated because of the economy of certain certain country actually. I think the world have changed. Um, I'll talk in totality basically. Uh, I wouldn't talk about just company. I think we need to have a new norm. A new norm where corporations have tremendous responsibility because the gap is widening. We are seeing this is win-win for everybody. Win-win for companies, win-win also for corporations. The other side of it, you might see a lot of social unrest. And we are seeing it. In the United States, you have 600 individuals. They made 930 billion during the pandemic. Meanwhile, you have 11 million people are unemployed in the same time. So what is the forum is doing here? And what is the purpose of, of, of the whole agenda is really how do we work together to save the planet? This is not a single issue for government, neither for company. This is a triangle between government, company, and society. And our moral responsibility, even as a government, we believe that the role of government will change in the future, will change because government will be evaluated not just on their internal policy, but also how much they extend the hand, how humane they are toward the rest of the world. And that's what we are doing here, part of what you are doing in this matrix. I believe that during the pandemic, when we gave hand or distributed over 120, 220 country globally in a tough time, in a time where country were just keeping everything for themselves, a new model has emerged where we said, yes, we'll look at ourselves, we'll take care of our people, but our people also are the rest of the world. So vaccine distribution, medical distribution, food distribution, went to 120 countries. So I think the relation between company, between government are much closer and should be much closer than before, or we might face a tremendous negative consequences. And we've seen it in certain country in a big, big time, especially in the West right now. If you look at what happened in the United States in the past couple of months, it is alarming for the rest of the world, actually. Thank you very much. That was excellent, by the way. Um, let's bring in Professor Schwab. And I wanted to get a trend that we've watched as financial journalists uh, over the last year, particularly in the West, and then I can bring Anand to, and Ilham to comment on this, the role of ESG when it comes to the large pension funds or the large university funds in the United States and, yes, Europe as well, is forcing action on investors. You look at the international uh, oil and gas companies, all six majors in Europe, Professor Schwab, uh, have committed to net zero by 2050. We've had two or three in the United States to do the same. But is this a case where money talks, Professor, and the money on Wall Street or the city of London or Frankfurt uh, in these uh, Western capitals is making a difference and accelerating the process? This is where the pressure is coming from? Yes, it's, um, it's a fact that we have now impact funds exceeding $1 trillion. So it's a good sign where the money will flow to in the future. Uh, let me come back to uh, uh, very rapidly to what uh, Minister Gargavi said. I think one lesson which we take out of this uh, crisis is mm. this notion of 
mutual interdependence. Because even as individuals, we had to be, take care not to infect someone else and not to be infected. And the same we have to apply now on a global level. As long as not everybody is vaccinated, nobody will be safe. Um, I think that's a message, uh, Minister, you, you had. But I, I have one other point, which is, uh, uh, and I, it relates to your question, John. Um, impact investment is uh, looking at uh, the ESG performance and uh, having a good performance is not contradictory to profits. I think company usually makes this uh, dichotomy between profits and being socially good. But actually today, a company with the millennials and so on will have much better employees, much more committed employees, much more productive mm. employees. Um, clients will be much more loyal. My daughter will not buy, uh, let's say, goods from a company which she knows is not in line with uh, societal objectives. So it's good for the company. It's good for the company. And final, final remark, I think when we look at the expression, what is disturbing is this notion of capitalism, because it's a notion coming out of the first industrial revolution. And capital was mainly related to financial capital. But wealth generation requires not just financial capital, it requires people capital, it requires social capital, it requires natural capital. So it's a new definition of mm. capitalism which we have today. Good. Uh, Anand, I, I saw in your notes here that you have this uh, common philosophy within Mahindra Group called RISE, and I, I think it plays well to what Professor Schwab was talking about because it goes far beyond shareholder return here. How is this applicable uh, to the Mahindra Group in terms of the totality of your workforce uh, and your consumer base at the same time. And can we have the emerging markets of the world embrace this move towards stakeholder capitalism? Something is a, a Western driven uh, metrics, but it clearly is not. You know, the um, rise movement, as we call it, uh, John, was hatched and incubated at Mahindra back in 2007, 2008, between the two years. And if you look back at that time, that was even before Occupy Wall Street. And it was an interesting, um, it was somebody who walked into my office and he was there really as an advertising agency trying to get us into the US market. And he came around and he said, you know, Anand, you don't understand your company. Now, whenever anyone tells me that, they get my attention. So I said, what do you mean? And he said, people here are either really onto something big or they're inhaling something illegal because they're all talking about not selling tractors, but about creating the next green revolution. They're talking about making people's lives better. And he said, there is a movement that's coming and it is a movement to address the lack of trust in large companies. Now, keep in mind, he said this before Occupy Wall Street. So it, it got my attention and I, and I've always been obsessed about why people come to work in our company every morning. To me, if you can find a purpose which is transcending, which goes beyond just there for your, your economic needs, then you're going to have a highly motivated workforce. So that's why we did it. But we obviously were fortunate in that we presaged a lot of what was going to happen in the world. So today, the RISE movement, as you, as you can see, is over 12 to 13 years old. And we have only found that it has become even more relevant. When you talk about relevance to emerging markets, it's going to be even more relevant in emerging markets because frankly, the biggest growth opportunity, John, in emerging markets is about addressing the bottom of the pyramid. Mm. So I have been saying for a long time ad nauseum that the tipping point will come on ESG and on stakeholder capitalism, when people stop seeing this as a trade-off or as something they have to mm. tick the box off or even something which they have to do to attract capital. When they see that, they're, that the biggest opportunity of the next decades is going to be ESG, <laughs> of course, climate is a big part of that, but just serving the needs of a rising population 
of a population with great aspiration, that's the biggest business opportunity. And let's face it, Adam Smith was right. We all have our self-interest at hand. When you can converge our self-interest with ESG, because that's the biggest growth opportunity the world is going to see, you don't have a trade-off and you don't have to worry about incentivizing. You just measure. And the measurement only serves as financial measurements do, as a kind of way of spurring you on to even newer heights. Uh, terrific. Uh, we have some fantastic questions from the audience. So I'm going to go to them now because they uh, flow into some of the topics we wanted to raise. And we only have 15 minutes left. So I'm going to ask you to uh, keep your answers within about 90 seconds, if you don't mind. This is a, a question to Ihan from Khalid uh, Machati, uh, a global shaper. How do uh, corporates move out of the CSR and charity category, if you will, right? The, the labeling of that and that approach to community intervention and the move to a more infrastructure development as a result, where you put money at place here to actually improve the infrastructure or to improve the lives. And as Anand was just saying, Ihan, uh, not to tick the box when it comes to charity or CSR. Yeah, it's, it's a great point. This is not about charity. This is about being good for the planet, the people and the pocket. It's actually sustainable. Listen, uh, I'm CEO of nearly 160 year old company. And I'm particularly conscious uh, of the need to ensure that a business that has been founded on strong ESG fundamentals are prerequisites for a valuable company that can stand to test the time. I truly believe people and companies who are not addressing it now are gonna disappear. Uh, and the ability now to measure, compare, and demonstrate to our key stakeholders the strength of this ESG credential uh, using a common framework is, is more than welcome. It's needed. And, and as it was well said, sustainability is a license to operate, actually, including the social responsibility. Customers and consumers, they demand it. Our customers, they want us to deliver solutions that help them to meet sustainability targets in many areas like clean mobility where we are acting. But employees equally, as it was well said, are proud uh, and future employees are proud to work for a company that takes responsibility in helping to solve the challenges of the society and the planet. Uh, and I think this is all get together at Solve. We have what we call Solve One Planet. We raise the bar. We realized that what took us here will not bring us there. So February last year, we, we launched our holistic uh, Solve One Planet with 10 goals around three pillars, climate, resources, and better life. And better life is about the people. You know, there is no uh, as society and people without the E. So it all goes together. Obviously, it, we're a chemical company, so safety is our priority. We aim for zero accidents. We accelerate the inclusion and diversity. Uh, as, as one policy, we just launched it 1st of January. We extend maternity leave and open it to all co-parents, regardless of their uh, orientation, to 16 weeks globally. So all of these are, are real examples that you need to walk the talk to be an attra attractive employer, to retain great talents, to, to nurture an inclusive environment with diversity of thoughts, uh, and, and I applaud, again, the private sector-led initiative of the WEF and the coalition of companies to commit to engage on those ESG new disclosures. Great. Uh, this is a fantastic uh, discussion here. Uh, again, to Minister Gergawi, uh, you recently published an article on LinkedIn and we uh, refer to five future trends in governments that they must adopt in a post-COVID world. Uh, what would you glean from uh, the five key points here uh, to share in governments and how it applies to these metrics that we're talking about, Minister? Uh, John, we believe that uh, as a government, just they need to be proactive. I, I mentioned five points through the, the article, actually. One, we have globally reverse globalization. And the trend didn't start today with the pandemic, with COVID, started a couple of years ago. Government have to be ready for the new challenges that they are facing, actually. So the pie is much smaller maybe than before here. Everybody's looking internally. And what happened with, with, with COVID, actually, it speed up the anti-globalization. So nationalistic government looking at very self-interest it became the most important thing for them political rhetoric also uh, got included in this number two i think trusting government is very important either 
citizen will trust government or what they do, or they lose completely the trust in government. So that's why government must make their decision fast and display high level of flexibility in amending and adopting to new law and regulation. I'll tell you what we've done actually. Even as a nation, whatever we couldn't do in 10 years when it comes to law regulation, it happened in a year, actually. It was very much fast forward. What situation of COVID gave the world actually, it's how do you adapt to a new change? And government, if government can adopt, they can move, they can do whatever they want to do in 10 years, just in one year, and we did it here. We found out that also national data is very important to track COVID, to track, you know, information, to know exactly where it's spreading. And unfortunately, government are lacking behind when it comes to data. You know, company they know about citizen in each country much more, much more than any government knows. And I think the world need a new models. That was my fourth point for governments. The model, the current model, it won't work in the long term. The changes that take place in human capital, but also in technology, also a new practice are changing the world and a lot of government, if they don't adopt, they'll be out of business. And the last point I mentioned in, in my article was, it's very important to partner with the private sector. Mm. As you stated here, you know, it's, it's people, it is the planet and it's a business, government have to adopt a similar method also. We need to work very closely with the private sector. These are the five points, uh, John. Okay, very good. Excellent uh, uh, contributions across the board here. We have another question. In fact, I have a, a series of questions, so we could use a bit more time. Uh, this is from uh, uh, Jim Schnaub, who's on the forum board, but also the chairman of Siemens and A.B. Moeller uh, Maersk. And I'd like to present it first to Anand. Uh, what happens uh, between now and Davos 2022 to make the stakeholder metrics, in your view, this whole framework uh, for all companies, you know, it's not habit to a limited uh, position. I'd like to have Anand address that, Ilam, and then I'm going to circle back to Professor Schwab. Okay, you're going to have to take out my crystal ball for that, John. Uh, but I think that as I, let me just start from where I left off earlier, that we have reached a tipping point where people have realized that this is not about CSR social responsibility. This is about business and staying alive as an enduring company. So once that tipping point is reached, people are going to have to require signposts that tell them how are they doing on that journey towards becoming a company that is aligned to these new requirements of opportunity and of requirements by the new consumers. And therefore, this is going to be taken extremely positively. What I'm referring to is the, is the whole WEF and IBC metrics for ESG. People, people respect the power of the WEF. There are a number of bodies around the world that are offering um, signposts and metrics, but the WEF has a particular iconic status. It has a convening power. It has a neutrality which is always uh, one of its highest qualities, and that's why Davos has been so successful. So for Klaus Schwab to use this convening power uh, and neutrality to, to present ESG metrics, I think is very timely. He announced today that 61 have signed up. I'm proud that we are one of the two Indian companies that have signed up. And we've signed up because we believe, just like a standard, you remember the old, the old thing between uh, Betamax and VHS was its own standard about a world which would it adopt. And like that, you need one standard that people can adopt. There are going to be a multiplicity, by the way, of metric opportunities. The, um, the WEF ones, the IBC ones are very broad. They're very useful because they're already data that we are reporting. So it's not going to be difficult. I also sit, by the way, John, on a fund called the RISE Fund. It's a fund promoted by TPG with a very, very, um, you know, very, very valuable board on it, very uh, wide ranging in its influence. And they have come out 
with a metric system as well called IMM, which tries to make it a little more financial. And they actually measure the, 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 the impact that you're having and how much of a multiplier it has. So there are going to be a number of choices that companies can use. By all means, they will use all of them. But I would bet in answer to the question that by come 2022, there are going to be a huge increase in the number of companies that have signed up for this, and it will become a standard that I think a lot of people will use. I'll go out on a limb to, to take that bet. Okay, thank you very much, Anand, for that. Another question from our audience, and uh, Ilan, we only have uh, five minutes left, and I want to call on Professor Schwab to uh, conclude some thoughts. How does this uh, fit into the SDG framework? You know, we have these 2030 targets, and one would argue the pandemic set us back, you know, tremendously. How can these metrics feed into the SDGs and accelerate that process from a corporate standpoint uh, in Europe? Well, it's all getting together and it's all aligned with the SDGs, right? So, uh, and coming back to what was said, right, I think um, every company had their own way of uh, uh, complying, pushing for the SDGs. And if we accept maybe a simple illustration, you need one leg representing regulator and standard setters as they have a critical role, another leg representing your investor, by which mean the, the portfolio managers and, and analysts on the front line on the marketplace. And the other one is the corporate issuers who depend on financial markets for their capital. And we need those three. And I think what's, what, what's happening now, and if I have to put a crystal ball by 2022, it will be evident that we really need to, to progress quicker. I think the co-construction of the framework is here. It's robust is pragmatic, uh, and without a coalition, they, they, they cannot be meaningful, uh, you know, rapid progress towards actually achieving the SDGs. So for a company like us, uh, we love it. We love that harmonization and standardization. It's key for global companies producing and competing on a global scale. Uh, and I think this makes the SDGs, right, very pragmatic and very actionable at a company level for the asset manager, portfolio manager, which I call in to join actually the movement, mm -hmm. right? Um, and this is very, very necessary for, you know, building a level playing field even, which should be a key priority for regulators. Thanks, Yohamed. To bring in Professor Schwab to conclude us here, uh, this is a very important year as I started the discussion because of COP26 uh, and also trying to foster uh, economic recovery. Do you worry, Professor Schwab, uh, that one gets parked and the acceleration onto the advanced Paris Accord gets lost in the need to restart growth around the world. And how do you prevent that as a, a contributor here to the global dialogue at WEF? Now, first, uh, we have to plan the recovery efforts and the fight against the um, virus with the long-term objectives. And the long-term objective is to shape the post-corona era. And certainly this post-corona era has to be more cohesive, more uh, equitable, and more sustainable. And what I, what I see is there was a question of uh, charity and uh, let's say uh, stakeholder capitalism. I think what is very uh, encouraging is that companies now say, integrate the SDGs, and that's important, into the strategy setting. And we never have seen <clears throat> in the forum such an engagement of companies in our activities. I come back to the, <clears throat> to the question of where would I like to see us in 22. Um, let's not forget <clears throat> um, we are working together with a number of standard setting, regulatory agencies, governments, because it's very important not to create now a competition who has the best standards. I think what we want to do is in cooperation with everybody who is already out in the field to create a generally accepted comparable system of metrics. And here, uh, in order to create the necessary impetus, the need to have um, uh, key companies uh, saying, yes, we accept 
uh, standards. They may change over time to a certain extent, but we are committed. We are committed not only to report, we are committed also to integrate those standards into our strategy setting. I think then we have made uh, good achievements. Yeah, so in the last years, I can think evidence to that. Uh, Professor Schwab, thanks for staying for the 45 minutes. It's good to have your contributions. Anand Mahindra, Mohammed Al Gargawi, His Excellency the Minister of Cabinet Affairs here in the UAE, Ilham Khadre of Salde, uh, Professor Schwab, and regrets from uh, Minister Mobweni uh, of South Africa who could not make it because of a horrible cyclone uh, in the eastern half of the country. Thanks for joining us. I'm glad uh, CNN could co partner with the World Economic Forum, as always. Uh, this is a very important issue, as I said, because of COP26 this year, uh, and also equally important, uh, Italy, is the recovery uh, status and trying to get that vaccine penetration high so confidence is rebuilt in the second half of 2021. Thanks for all the questions from the audience. They were superb, and appreciate your uh, attendance to this session.